I'm back again with my friend Art Wolf, and uh, we're going to have a, a, a great little chat here. Um, I've been in many places with Art around the world. I think you know, I was trying to count them up, but and I think there's uh, Greenland, Australia, Italy, Antarctica, Alaska, Salvard, Atacama, Bolivia. We had a hell of a day in Rome one time, too, didn't we? So, Oh, uh, that was a great day in Rome. Anyway, Art's um, not only a good friend, um, and, and we share uh, a big passion in photography, but uh, he's a prolific uh, book publisher. And uh, today we want to talk about his latest book. And I have to tell you that there's always an Art Wolf book on my t coffee table, and there's going to be another Art Wolf book on my table again. Seems I think I looked last night and I've got Trees and the Human Canvas. If you haven't ever seen any of Art Wolf's books, uh, you can go to the link in the article as well as in the, the description below. But check his books out. He's published over 100 books in his lifetime so far, probably 120 or more. But, I mean, that's a lot of books. But the, the Human Canvas, I still think, and that's, of course, the how I connected with art many, many years ago is um, uh, one of the finest uh, published books I've ever seen. And uh, when I show it to my friends that come over for print workshops and other things, they just are astounded that it's a photograph. And um, that's quite a bit of work. And it also is a, a deviation from your normal wildlife and um, landscape work. You know, I've been fighting uh, the perception that I'm a wildlife photographer for years. My background's painting and art and graphic design. And so, yeah, wildlife and including this latest book, which is entirely about wildlife, but I try to be as broad a spectrum as I can. You know, I go, I teach photography as art where we go into degraded environments and find things that look like a William de Kooning or a Jackson Pollock. As you know, I do a lot of cultural work. I try to be as broad as I can. And the book I'm working on right now is called Act of Faith, which looks at all the world's religions and voodoo and shamanism and all the crazy things that people believe. But yeah, wildlife is where my name is definitely attached to. Well, it, it might be attached to it, but you know, all the other things that you do and, and a book like the human canvas really kind of show the, you know, how broad your, your scope is, where your influence comes from. The other thing I got to tell everybody that's listening is that if you have the opportunity to hear art, do a, a talk in public. Um, he's got a creativity series and a whole lot of other things. Uh, you, you'll have um, a unique experience. It's not only motivating, it's, it's beautiful, but no matter who you are, even if you're not a photographer, you can relate to what art talks about, what art shows, and it kind of makes you want to be a photographer after you see them. So anyway, let's talk about the, the new book, Wild Lives. Yeah, I've got a copy right here. You want me to lift it up? Yeah, let's lift it up if you can. It's, it's a big one. Definitely the heaviest, biggest book I've done so far. Yeah. And Look how ten pounds. That's Look how thick it is. Ah, oh. you know, I, I've had the PDF of it. Uh, the the bear cover is that Katmai? Ah, uh, yeah. And in fact, I know that bear. You know that bear I photographed as a spring cub. And then for the following four years, I photographed it. Then suddenly it shows up with uh, three babies of its own. And it routinely, when we go up there every year, the end of July and early August, we find this bear and the bear finds us. And she brings her cubs to us, puts the cubs right down in front of us. And then she goes off 100 yards up the river fishing. She is smart and other bears have clued in that when their cubs are close to humans, four bears, which would go after the cubs, the male bear, uh, they don't come close to humans. And so the bears are using humans as protection for their cubs. I think it's a great story, and it is a true story. Well, that's kind of cool. I mean, I've done a, I've done Katmai with you, and I, I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> it was quite an experience walking up a creek for a day and just having all this bear activity around you and it's really cool isn't it because people that have read grisly accounts of bear maulings they're really apprehensive of being in a environment with big brown bears these are super grizzlies and yet the grizzlies for a long long time have reconciled that humans aren't a threat to them certainly not within Katmai or the greater Katmai environmental uh, area and so they are chilled out. They'll come within five feet of you with their cubs. 
And it's a, a, a pretty good experience. It makes you feel like you're part of nature. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it really, I went, I was pretty affected by that when we were there because we had the cub experience and the bears in the water and charging at what looked like they were charging at you, but a, 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 a salmon right in front of you. It's a, was it was a very cool trip, but you know, that, that cover is just astounding. Um, you know, I think we all talked about getting that one shot where the, the bear is coming at you like that. And, um, you, you, that's a, the, the cover alone is just incredible. Thank you. I say good things happen to bad people. I mean, I was lucky with that one. You know, the bear came from a long ways away, was running straight at me. And I knew there was a pool full of salmon in between. And so I just stayed on point. And, you know, Kevin, 10 years ago, we would never be able to get a shot like that. But technology is advancing so fast that that autofocus, staying with a bear running straight at you, that's the reason I got the shot. I made the decisions to have a high ISO and great depth of field and faster than a faction. But, you know, these cameras these days are really making it better and easier for all of us. It's Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I remember that iceberg we did on our last Antarctica trip before they shut the world down. You know, on the very last night or something, we're drifting by it. It's almost dusk. And we both just stood shoulder to shoulder and we're shooting high ISOs, which people said they should never do. And with the noise reductions and the, all the, the software that's out these days, especially what's in the new Lightroom these days, uh, you know, you don't even worry about it anymore. It's a double-edged sword, right? Because when I first started out in the, uh, let's see, what decade was it? The Probably during the 80s, I was really getting into it. Okay. And, you know, the animal had to be partially dead before you could get it in focus because we had such low ISOs with our films. Now, everybody can actually get decent, if not really good photos. And it makes being a professional photographer that much more difficult. You know, a lot of things in photography, the way we know it, are changing. And a lot of photographers are having a hard time. Galleries are shutting down and closing and photographers aren't selling prints. And so, you know, it's a whole new ball game. But, um, you know, it's great that everybody has the experience. But I think, you know, a lot of things happened during the pandemic, not to blame the pandemic, but I think just new challenges have come out. And like a lot of times in our life, like switching from analog to digital, you know, we're at another crossroad where we have to rethink how we photograph. Well, I make the analogy, you have to be a crab on the beach. You have to run from the oncoming wave and then run back out. And if you stay stationary and locked into a certain set of uh, things that you've historically done, you could be obsolete overnight. And so I think part of, you know, success is to constantly evolve with the times. That's the thing I think people have to be open to, especially you and I have adapted many times and have shared those experiences. But, you know, that's a, a challenge that comes. But I think also looking at the new technology makes things even more exciting. Like, the camera that Sony just announced, which is that new A9, that actually pre-records frames like for five seconds or whatever time frame you say before you even shoot the button. So it's always doing a loop. So you put the focus button down and while that focus button's down, it's capturing whatever's going on. And when you see like the bird take off and you push the button, it all by the time it takes off and you have the chance to push the button, it's already recorded those pieces of flight. So you now at, you know, 120 frames a second, I mean, you've got gazillion images, but you're capturing images you could never capture before. Honestly, we're on the cusp of, if not already into it, AI. And with this book, Wild Lives, and I want to steer us back to this book, it, uh, you know, there's no uh, captive animals in it. There's no digital manipulation, as, you know, critics would say. It is got no AI. And I think, sadly, we have to make those statements. I, I really didn't put that on the book because the book was already in process. But I think going forward, I think there will be a greater value on what people know to be real and wild and not manipulated or create. This, that's, it's going to be a challenge. But I think what astounded me when I shared the book with Deborah last night was the amount of wildlife you have photographed, the places you've been to photograph this wildlife. I mean, I was just just taken back from everything. You, you, the, the birds, the the uh, the, the four legged creatures, the, the Africa, the you know the the northern and southern polar regions, 
it's it's what a body of work. I mean, it's taking you what probably your your lifetime in photography to collect enough images to do this or. Well, you know, the thing is that there are a few photos that date back even into the 80s. But for the most part, everything was shot in the last five years. And I want, you know, I don't want people to buy a book and say, oh, my God, I've seen this, 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 this in other books. You know, that would be a big letdown. And so there is a hand, handful of that of photos that people might recognize from before, because it is a book of my favorite wildlife. There's no doubt about it. But for the last five years, I've been just on the road shooting from the Himalayas, underwater coral reefs. You know, I, I went after uh, as many charismatic animals, but also less known animals. But it is not a catalog of the world's animals. It's just my favorite photos taken over the last five uh, years. Uh, 350 pages of photos with multiple images on some of those pages. It's a big volume. And honestly, I believe it may be. You know, this sounds arrogant, but I think it is probably the finest book on international wildlife by a single photographer produced. I mean, if that's not the bar I was uh, trying to achieve, um, I came close to it. Well, first off, you know, I got to compliment you. Paper selection on the book was excellent. The, there's no bleed through of images from either side, which is probably accounting for a lot of the weight, the, you know, the paper weight that goes in it. So, and, and the layout is really well done. So whoever did your layouts did great. But I think one of the things that I always appreciate about your books is the dialogue that's in the books. For example, when you made the book Trees, it's one of the first times I've ever sat down and read every single word in that in regards to the different species of trees that, you know, you covered in, in that amazing book. And in this book, you have um, Gregory Green um, doing... Uh, this guy is amazing. Who, who? How did you bump into him? Thirty over thirty years ago, he was a wildlife biologist down in Oregon, and I was doing a book on owls. And so I ran into him. I actually deliberately ran into him, and uh, I started a lifelong fr a friendship. Now he has built a career, and 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 uh, eventually retired from being a wildlife biologist to being a teacher up at Western Washington. Uh, college up in or university up in Bellingham, Washington. But when I asked him to write for this book, I thought, OK, I'm I'm doing you know, I, I'm thinking I'm giving him a favor, you know. And in fact, he did us a favor by agreeing to write. His words are eloquent and nuanced and not the type of writing that's scientific and dry and ultimately boring. He really took the challenge and did a great, great job on his words. Well, I think he brings out a lot of the importance of what's going on in wildlife today, the challenges with climate change and other things that wildlife faces, not only, you know, from the human side, but of course, from, you know, the, the environment side that, you know, the, the wildlife faces. So I have to say, and I, I think that's what enjoys, it's fun to look at the pictures and pictures are worth a thousand words, but it's also interesting to get a little more um, intellect and, and a little more thought about what all this is really about and the fact that we all live on the same planet together and face a lot of the same challenges, but he did an excellent job. So my hat's off to you on that one. Now he's a really, sounds like a great guy. He is a really great guy. Uh, I just gave a talk in Portland, Oregon a uh, couple of nights ago and he was there and we're signing books and I, uh, he gets up on stage and reads a couple passages from the book and I know he's happy about it. I want to say that when I give my talks, I acknowledge that there's animal populations that are in trouble. There's no doubt about it. But there's also great stories that people would not necessarily know. And for instance, you know, there's more whale species and more whales in the ocean than there has been since 1950. There's more mountain lions in North America than, than there's been in 200 years. Uh, mountain gorillas, tigers, uh, snow leopards, they're all, if not holding steady, they're on the increase. And so in our news these days, if it bleeds, it leads. You've heard that expression. Right. Negative news is what gets the headlines. But there's great stories out there. And I wanted to remind people that it's not, not all hopeless, that we've showed time in and time out that looking towards a species, figuring out what's the trouble, 
rectifying that, you know, we have uh, bald eagles nesting in virtually every large Seattle park now. And I would never see a bald eagle. Really? Living That's kind of cool. So I, I think we need to balance the, the negative with positive stories, because if you give people hope, they're more likely to contribute or to lend a hand on environmental issues. And that was my personal um, take and why I worked hard on this book was to offer encouragement to people and to educate people and inspire people. Those are the things that drive me as a human being. Well, I, I can attest to that, obviously sharing uh, a lot of time with you over the years. But um, question for you, though, I mean, let's just back off to the technical side of things. I'm curious, you know, a lot of people always want to know what it takes to publish a book. So to do a book, what are the steps you normally go through you know, image selection and printing, you know, how, the time length it takes, what, 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 what's involved? War. It's war. <laughs> it's war with the publisher. It's war with the designers. It's war with my own staff because a good book really uh, takes all different opinions. You can't just override because this is your favorite book and have all the photos that you want in the book. No, it's compromise. And in that compromise, becomes a better book. And so the publisher had his own ideas. Thankfully, the publisher has done most of my recent books and is really got the same aesthetic that I do. And that is why when you open a book that size, you're not losing half the image in the gutter of a book. It's about how you bind the book. And as you pointed out, the paper choices, the printing. I love working with this publisher because the book, the book looks better than I ever expect. And that is always the great moment when you open the book for the first time. But it is overshooting, overshooting, selecting down, letting go of your some of your favorite shots. And it's all about compromise. And then the writers, uh, the editors have to edit down Greg's writing because he writes more than can be published in a book. And so we all are adults at this point, somewhat. And it's just how all these different entities come together to produce a really nice uh, book that entertains, educates, inspires. Well, mission accomplished. So how, how can people get a hold of this book? They can buy it through Costco. They can buy it through a local bookstore if they stock it. Um, and if they want personal inscriptions, they come to artwolf.com uh, and uh, virtually... If I'm in Seattle, I will sign, inscribe, you know, to the particular people. And I've been doing that for the last three or four days. And yeah, this time of the year, I mean, the book came in late. It came in in November rather than in September when most fall books come out. Uh, what happened is in India, there was a COVID outbreak during the months of March and April. And a lot of people were affected. And they shut down the presses. And so everything got backed up. It uh, wasn't as bad as the year of COVID where everything was locked up in freighters floating around in front of cities, but it did slow down the process. But I think this book will sell as I uh, travel the country and give talks. And we're, we're, you know, we're looking at Chicago, well, Indianapolis, uh, Chicago, Washington, New York, you know, all the expected cities as much as we can get me in because I'm still working on four other books right now. And so it's teaching workshops, it's guiding tours, it's giving talks about the book. There is no days off in my life and people laugh at that, but the people that really know me would agree. And I think you realize that of me. I'm not a vacationer. I love work. It's passion. It's everything I'm involved with. I love working. You know, I think we share that in common. I have a lot of friends that you know, we're insurance salesmen or work regular kind of jobs. And, you know, they, they retired and walked out the door one day and never turned around. And people say, well, when are you going to retire, Kevin? I said, well, what, what's, why, why would I want to retire? You know, uh, you know, I'll retire when I drop dead somewhere in the forest. Yes, that's it. You know, I, I think that the, I teach a lot of workshops and in fact, you have to be part psycho psychologist to teach a workshop. And there are so many people that have made their money through being doctors or lawyers or whatever it may be. And then they want to know how they make money from their work. And it's like, come on, you made your money. Why not use photography as passion? 
the minute you try to struggle making a buck from your work, then stress and, uh, and you know anxiety comes. And so keep it fun, keep it a passion, and live a longer life because of that. It's the reason I get out of bed. Yeah, I do make money from the work, but I've got a staff of five people that all have uh, benefits from healthcare and all that. So that means I've got to really stay on the road and I'm fine. I'd rather do that than get lazy and watch TV all day long and probably check out of earth, uh, you know, years early. Yeah, but I hear, I hear you on that. And, you know, I think when you, when you have the passion of photography, people go, well, you've been shooting since you were like a teenager. I said, yeah. And you know, a lot of people say they get burnout, but I have never yet found burnout in my life. I, I, I turn around and, and pick up something new in photography, try something different. There's always a project I wake up with, with, you know, this morning, like this morning I woke up and had my coffee and read, read through the PDF of the book and, you know, couldn't wait to talk to you again. And, you know, there's, there's every day has a special moment. Last week we were in Antarctica and the guy on the ship, the, the photographer on the ship, we had a drone permit and he photographed the bubbling bubble feed of uh, the humpbacks. Oh, wow. And it, they actually create a whole spiral as they come up. And, you know, he's got the pictures of them coming up like you talk about a moment where, you know, we're, we're 50 feet away from them in, in Zodiacs, but we can't see that part. And, you know, it, we, we were just on hundreds of whales. It was an incredible, uh, you know, whale day for, you know, one of well, those. I'm, trips. I'm, I'm sure the photographer got great shots. I also have a uh, aerial shot of bubble net feeding with whales in the middle because it is. From a, a water point of view, it is very difficult. Now, I've got some drone shots in the book of a blue whale and Sea of Cortez or an aerial shot over the great migrations. And so you get special permission and you do it right. And people often either love drone shots or they hate them. But even the ones that hate hearing a drone love the pictures from it. And, you know, I only cite the BBC and... Uh, Attenborough's work that often is made up of a lot of drone shots. People love that. And then they hear a drone and then they get all pissed off over it. So it's, it, it's kind of a love hate relationship. It, it is a love hate, but it, you know, it does give a perspective that, you know, I've seen a few pictures of that, but I've never seen a video so well done. And to think that this, these whales coordinate and, and spin around and bubble the whole time before they come up because it's usually two or three of them in, in one of those things. But I think what I'm, I, I'm coming back to is that, you know, even while you're photographing the wildlife, being there next to wildlife, especially like whales when, you know, they're popping up five feet from your, your zodiac and that these are magnificent creatures and they're talking and the noise and the, every, it's just the, the experience alone, you put the camera down and just, dig the experience. And, you know, I think when I look at all the pictures in your book, those experiences, if I got that from just the whales, what you must get from doing all those uh, images that you've done um, in, in, in the book. It's, it's too much to process at once. You look through the photos and it triggers the memory. You know, I am, I suck at remembering names, honestly, because I give a lot of public talks and the next day it's somewhere else. But I can remember the story around any photo I've ever taken, including the very first photo, wildlife photo, which is in the lead of the book. It's a, a moose shot in 1968 from a canoe up in Canada. And I can remember everything around that. And so uh, it makes for a good series of conversations when you're in, in the public recalling the story around the photo. You don't hesitate. You've got it right in your mind. And so... Those memories, as you say, and I agree, you look through the book and it just, everything comes back alive. And I love that feeling. Yeah. I mean, I looked at the, you know, we had that Arctic fox in, in Salvard. You have that picture in the book where it, it grabbed that chick from up top of the cliff and yeah. came running down to the beach with it. That was like an extraordinary moment. You know, the, the, we have, you have a, in the section on the Arctic, I think you have the picture of the polar bear on that tundra area that we found in that snowstorm that day, way far away, but still such a, uh, to see that animal in that landscape was like. <laughs> are, are you referring to the one that it's got all red carpet? Yeah, all red, right yeah, up on the yeah, hill. So beautiful. That was in uh, East Greenland and it right. was so beautiful. 
But it's tiny in the frame, you know. Yeah, it's really tiny cool. in the frame. I, we were, I think we were on different zodiacs, but it was just like, wow, you know. Sometimes you don't have to have that full animal in the picture to, to understand that the picture in that case was the animal in the landscape. It was just uh, you did a double page of that one there, and that was really cool to see. I mean, I could talk forever with you about this, and you know, as we've done many times before. But um, I, to, to all my viewers and readers, this. This is an extraordinary book, again, by Art Wolf. And um, I, I stress that, you know, it's one, get this book and look at it. Because if you're a photographer and ever do wildlife, you'll certainly appreciate it. I think it's selling for around $95, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's uh, probably slightly cheaper somewhere, uh, you know, in the, like, Amazon. Although I think they're holding steady at the r real price. It really is a $100 book. I mean, when you pick it up and look at the breadth of it, and the quality of it, it is a hundred dollar book. We do also sell a five hundred dollar version with a clamshell box and a print and all of that. But yeah, the ninety five dollar book is a real, you know, it's an honest price. It's not only an honest price, but it's an investment that you know you'll look at time and time and time again. And especially if you have friends and uh, other people over, like Deborah and I, a lot of times do. And the books are on the coffee table and. You know, we have a big coffee table and we encourage people, pick these books up and you pass them around and say, well, you know, we know this guy and look at this shot. Kevin was with this guy when he shot that one. And, you know, it's just there's such great photography in it. So thank you. Um, I have to compliment you. It's um, an amazing book. I'm happy. Uh, I can't wait for my copy to come, but it's it's uh, quite an accomplishment. And thank you. Um, I'm proud to call you my friend and. Um, you were my best man at my wedding too, which was kind of fun. Was um, I the flower girl or the best man though? Oh, you were the best man. You, even though you picked your own flowers. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. a great experience. And, uh, and everything you said towards me goes right back to you, Kevin. You're a nice. great guy. And, uh, I, I will look forward to working with you in the future. Anyway, um, Art, thank you for all the time. Um, the friendship and this book, um, uh, which, you know, we look forward to sharing with a lot of our friends. Um, uh, you know, your accomplishments are are great, and I look forward to hopefully uh, seeing you when you visit Indianapolis to to do a, a talk here, which I, I'm will work further on with with your team. We're so, going to get that scheduled, absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, I appreciate the time. We could go on forever, but you know, we don't want people cutting out of the video too soon. So, uh, you know, I'll have some pictures on the article uh, on the book and uh, please check out photo PXL. If you're on the YouTube side of things where you'll see a little more detail about, uh, all this and, um, art to all of you and your, your team, uh, appreciate it very much. Let's talk sometime again real soon. Okay. Thank you, Kevin.